Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're pleased to have you join us for the first California Current Acidification Network Roundtable Discussion of 2023. For this new webinar series entitled Conversations on Ocean Carbon, a U.S. West Coast and Alaska Perspective, CCAN is teaming up with the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network and California Ocean Science Trust to deliver the best available information on marine carbon dioxide removal and to explore concepts related to coastal ocean carbon. This webinar series is intended to create a direct dialogue among industry members, tribes, natural resource managers, and scientists within the California Current and Alaska ecosystems. Through these co-designed webinars, participants will gain a better understanding of MCDR technologies, limitations, risks, and learn how to become engaged. During the presentations, attendees will be in listen-only mode. Throughout the presentations, you are encouraged to type questions for the expert panel into the question box at the bottom of your control panel. Organizers will be monitoring incoming questions and will pose them to our speakers after their presentations. We are also recording this session and will share the recording on the CCAN Alaska OA Network and OST website. To get a better sense of the community joining us today, I'm going to launch a quick poll question to gauge who is new to our group. Natalie, can you launch the first poll question? So this will be a helpful data point for the California Current Acidification Network to know who has been participating in our webinars in past years and who is new to attend this MCDR series. Wonderful. Many new faces to the group. Well, welcome again, and thank you for joining us. I'm Alex Harper. I'm with the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System, and I'm the organizer for CCAN, the California Current Acidification Network. I will be helping to moderate today's session and running the logistics of the webinar. I'm joined by my co-organizers, Lauren, Darcy, and Natalie, who will be helping to walk us through the next 45 minutes of presentations, followed by a moderated q and I'll turn it over briefly to my other organizers uh, to introduce themselves and their organizations. Darcy, passing it to you. Thank you, Alex. I'm Darcy Dugan. I'm with the Alaska Ocean Observing System and the director of the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network. And I just want to thank you all for joining us and for your interest in learning more about this topic. And I will be moderating the Q&A today later in the session. Um, I'll pass it off to Natalie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm a 2023 Canals Fellow in the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program Office. And ocean acidification mitigation strategies are a part of our program's mandate. OAP supports CDR efforts, including housing a subprogram on CDR that's been leading a $25 million grant opportunity that closed in February. Announcements will be expected this fall. If you would like to learn more about NOAA OAP's CDR efforts, please reach out to the CDR co leads, one of whom is a panelist today, Jessica Cross. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Lauren. Great. Thanks, Natalie. And hello and welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Lauren Linsmeyer, a senior science officer at the California Ocean Science Trust, or OST. OST is grateful to be co-hosting this webinar today. And for those of you who may not know about our organization, 
We are an independent nonprofit created by the California legislature to bring cutting edge science to the decisions shaping the future of our ocean and coast. With funding from the Climate Works Foundation, OST is working to elevate awareness and understanding of MCDR among California policymakers to support informed decision making. In the coming year, we'll be conducting a number of informational and level setting activities, including educational tours of several MCDR R&D test sites in California, as well as hosting webinars like this one. Our hope is that these convenings serve to stimulate productive dialogue and thoughtful collaboration along our co connected coastline. I'll also be guiding us through the presentation portion of today's webinar. Um, great. We are very excited to have a panel of nationally and globally esteemed ocean carbon experts joining us today, representing academic, federal government, and nonprofit research perspectives. The title of today's webinar is An Overview of Marine Carbon Dioxide Removal, or MCDR, Science Policy and Decision Making. I will briefly introduce each of the speakers before handing it over to them to give around 10 minute presentations followed by moderated Q&A. Before we get to the fantastic speakers, we'll have another poll question uh, to help us co-design future webinars and engagements of this community on MCDR by understanding which region you're located in. So the question should appear on your screen now. Great, thanks so much for everyone's responses. And we do apologize if your region was not captured in those answers were uh, limited to just five responses, but if you're located outside of these regions, we hope to hear from you more in the future. Uh, so our first speaker is Dr. Jessica Cross, research oceanographer with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in Seattle, Washington. Jessica is a re research scientist that works at the interface between the research and engineering communities to develop new tools to explore how our oceans su support sustainable development and continue, excuse me, contribute to climate risk management. As an oceanographer with NOAA, she leads the agency's carbon dioxide removal task force and manages the carbon system observing research and development for the Alaska and Pacific Arctic regions. Looking forward to Jessica starting us off with an overview of MCDR and helping us frame some of these important research questions and challenges. Over to you, Jessica. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, I am gonna attempt to share my screen here. Uh, is that working? Not yet, but I believe Natalie will be making you a presenter and you should be able to share your screen. We can see your screen. We see your screen now. Yay, huzzah. Okay, awesome. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, um, thank you so much uh, for having me as a part of this webinar today uh, and for that kind introduction. My role here is to really just introduce the concept of CDR to those of you that may not be familiar with it. And as we move through the program today, we're gonna get deeper into um, not necessarily technical detail, but some additional concepts. Um, so if you have questions based on what I share right now, know that we may end up digging into it a little bit more as we go along. So the first thing that uh, I will note is that when we come to CDR, we come to it sort of with this scientific consensus in mind that 
we're not going to be able to meet our climate goals without some kind of legacy carbon removal from the atmosphere. Um, in the recent uh, uh, AR6 report, the most recent report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC for short, um, all of the different groups of scenarios that allow us to meet our climate goals involve CDR in one way or another. Uh, and that's imaged by this uh, bar chart in the lower left of my slide right here. This first group of bars represents our first climate goal, which is to achieve only 1.5 degrees Celsius with limited warming or with limited overshoot. The second set of bars represents sort of our median climate goal, which is to again, limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with maybe a little bit more overshoot. And then the third set of bars um, limits warming just below two degrees Celsius. But what I want you to notice here is that these blue bars are at almost 100% for each of these different groups of scenarios, indicating that we're going to need CDR of some kind. Three different forms of CDR are imaged in this bar chart. The blue bars are bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. The yellow bars are direct air uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, and then uh, the gray bars, which you really only see two of, um, are for enhanced weathering. These are the CDR strategies that we know the most about and accordingly are the easiest to model. But I want to emphasize that you'll hear about more uh, technologies than that today. And even the IPCC acknowledges that these are just proxies. It's a way of thinking about carbon removal uh, in its entirety. The point being, regardless of what kind of CDR that we need, we know we're going to need some in order to meet um, all of our climate goals. So uh, in order to do that, I wanna emphasize we're not ready. Um, we don't necessarily have a technology scaled to the point that we need in order to do this. Um, to make up for unavoidable emissions, it's very likely that we're going to need to extract 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year uh, out of the atmosphere by 2050 and maybe increasing to 20 by about 2100. And that's going to require something like a 6% annual growth uh, in this industry, which is just what you're seeing on this chart right here. Uh, for any of you that invest in stocks um, or are following, um, uh, uh, the global markets, we all know that 6% is a pretty darn good return on growth uh, on the annual scale. GDPs don't grow like that. We usually target somewhere between 1% and 2%. So to say we need 6% growth per year is, is pretty serious. And what does that look like uh, ultimately in the end? If we need you know, something like 10 gigatons by 2050 and 20 gigatons of removal by 2100, ultimately what we're talking about is doubling either the ocean sink or the land sink for carbon. Um, and you can see that in the plot that I'm showing here on the right. On the left-hand side, these wedges represent the global sources and sinks of carbon dioxide in our system right now. Um, for those of you that have a little more familiarity, we refer to this as our global carbon budget. Sources are uh, on the up uh, uh, above the zero line and sinks for carbon, the way that land and oceans um, uh, uh, naturally draw down carbon dioxide are, are below the zero line. And so what we're doing uh, with these bars on the far right hand side of this chart is just imaging how much CDR we think we're going to need. And those bars are about the same size as uh, these wedges that you see um, below the zero line on the left. So this is a lot of carbon to remove, not just a lot of industry to scale up, but a lot of uh, ecosystem perturbation as well. That being said, private industry has heard the call. Um, despite the fact that these technologies are at an early scale, um, folks like JP Morgan have said 6% annual growth, sign me up. Um, and they're starting to engage in what are called advanced market commitments, essentially investing in companies that are you know, supplying carbon removal, even though they may not be able to deliver on those removed tons yet. It's essentially a way of getting in um, uh, while the getting in's good. Uh, and so what you see with this line plot here on the right-hand side of this chart, uh, is uh, just the total cumulative tons of removal uh, sort of being traded uh, in the marketplace right now. And just in May of this year, JP Morgan purchased 800,000 tons um, from a variety of different sources, which essentially quadrupled the size of the market, really threw a lot of gas uh, on it uh, just in May of this year. So given these challenges that we're facing, can we remove enough carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? And especially if we're gonna move fast and break things, can we do it in a way that is safe, sustainable, and fair? And really that's the topics that we're gonna to be getting into uh, on our webinar together today. 
Uh, like I said earlier, there are many different ways to remove carbon from the atmosphere. You can see a lot of them imaged in this plot. I'm not going to go through every single one, but I do want to break them down essentially into two categories for you. The first one is photosynthesis. If you think back to your high school chemistry class, maybe you remember that plants breathe carbon dioxide the same way that we as humans um, breathe oxygen. And so the idea is that we want to use plants, whether these are terrestrial plants, coastal plants or ocean plants of some kind to draw that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it as organic matter. The other thing that we might be able to do is use chemistry, whether we're talking about electrochemistry or membranes, what we really want to be able to do is pull carbon dioxide directly out of ocean water or directly out of the atmosphere and store it as carbon dioxide or as minerals. Regardless of the method of CDR that we engage in, it's important to remember that it takes a lot of energy and other resources in order to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so what these bar charts are showing you on the right-hand side is that we need a lot of energy to remove carbon from the atmosphere. That's true for methods like direct air capture or direct ocean capture. We may need a lot of water. Um, you can see that in the lower right-hand side. That's true for afforestation um, or for bioenergy production. And sometimes we may need a lot of land uh, just to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, especially if we're relying on photosynthesis. And that's definitely true for afforestation or bioenergy uh, solutions as well. And, you know, overall, what we want to think about is those resource demands, especially at scale, get to be pretty significant. Um, so if what we want to do is engage in mineralization at that 10 gigatons of removal, we're talking about pulling half the world's cargo ship fleet off the market. Think about how challenging it's going to be for you to get your Amazon deliveries if half the world's cargo ships are suddenly taken away. Uh, when we're talking about direct air capture or direct ocean capture, that is a lot of electricity it takes to run those plants. Almost 100,000 times the current offshore wind capacity that we have right now, or really even 80% of the global energy production. Think about if I tried to reduce your energy footprint by 80%. Pretty significant, hard to charge your phone. The same with macroalgae. We'd need a band of kelp essentially all around the global coast to remove 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year from the atmosphere with additional impacts. You can imagine that maybe if we increased ship traffic, increased energy production, increased kelp, we're gonna have massive impacts on the environment, right? So there's current research that suggests that the more methods we have of removing carbon from the atmosphere, the more we can distribute that load across a variety of different places or across a variety of different resource inputs. And overall, that helps the development of these technologies be more sustainable. We don't want to invest too heavily in direct air capture or afforestation and end up starving people in the process of pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere because we start competing with agriculture. So what these charts are showing are essentially different um, portfolios of carbon removal paired with um, uh, uh, incentives for developing that carbon removal. And the more methods you have and the better incentives you are able to produce overall, your energy demands for removing this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere go down over uh, uh, these different sets of scenarios. Uh, it's very likely when we think about, you know, which methods do we want to develop first, we're looking for things that can be um, uh, uh, cost effective, but that are also highly effective. We don't want to develop a cheap method that doesn't really do its job, right? Uh, and so others on this call will talk more about this, um, uh, but again, we're looking for low cost, highly effective, and durable methods, carbon dioxide that stays out of the atmosphere for a long time actually measuring how long that carbon stays locked away and whether or not it's been actually removed from the atmosphere is really challenging. Even for things like renewable energy, measuring the overall impact that uh, those projects have on the atmosphere and on global warming can be really uh, uh, difficult. Um, so this is a, a study that was um, published in Bloomberg Green that's essentially showing how, you know, these different types of projects actually remove carbon from the atmosphere, what percent of them do. It's only 35% of renewable energy projects are actually net negative. And down here at the bottom, 0% of carbon removal technologies had been proven at the time of this study to actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But there's been a recent study, third-party verification of a direct air capture plant that actually does show that that carbon is being locked away effectively. 
Another key challenge that we face in making these measurements is estimating and evaluating ecosystem and human impacts. All methods of CDR are going to impact an environment of some kind, whether it's a land environment, a coastal environment, or an ocean environment. Some may have important co-benefits, others may have important risks. And so as we think about MRV, we want to be including as much as we can these interdisciplinary questions. So that leaves us with these ideas of like, okay, well, what do we need to do first? How do we actually start developing these um, technologies and, and, and uh, 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 how do we bring them uh, to scale? Um, so the first thing that we need are scalable interdisciplinary maps. We want to be able to narrow in on the local scale for small projects, but we also want to be able to make measurements at the big scale. We know that it needs to be interdisciplinary, measuring not just carbon dioxide removal, but also the impact on environments and ecosystems. Systems. And last, people make decisions based on maps. They want to know where to issue permits um, for carbon dioxide removal projects. They want to know how their local backyard is going to be impacted, right? So we have examples of what that looks like so far, uh, and one of those is this um, plot uh, from uh, 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 NOAA that's showing our coastal our aquaculture opportunity areas program or our coastal aquaculture planning portal. My agency, NOAA, is, makes these kinds of scalable interdisciplinary maps all the time. Um, and so what we want to do is we just want to take that infrastructure and tune it uh, so that we're able to make those same kinds of decisions for a variety of different CDR methods. If you're curious more about the kind of NOAA tools and techniques that we're interested in, um, we released our final strategy for carbon dioxide removal research a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you can find um, all those materials at the QR code that's shown on your screen. The report is long, and even though we tried not to make it very technical, uh, sometimes it's a lot to digest. If you don't feel like reading 60 plus pages of material, you can check out the two-pager of key messages that's the image in the lower right-hand corner, also available at that QR code that you see on the screen right now. I'll also emphasize that the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries is also starting to consider how we implement CDR in sanctuary settings. Again, thinking about important risks and co-benefits and how we make decisions. Um, and you can find um, more about that sanctuary guidance at the QR code that you've seen shown on the screen right here. Last, I'll say that uh, it's very clear that Congress has heard um, that this is going to be not just um, expensive, but an economic opportunity. Uh, and so there's been a lot of public investment in CDR research. Um, there's some statistics shown there on the screen, but I'll direct your attention to the bar chart that essentially shows along the bottom the amount of annual investment on average that we spend on renewable energy and the amount of investment that's been recommended in CDR by the National Academies. It's about $65 million a year. Um, um, the uh, 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 that $65 million in FY24 was provided. We had, uh, in fact, exceeded that by about 60%. Um, since the debt ceiling deal, it's very likely that that extra 60% that we got in fiscal year 24 uh, will have to last us for at least a couple of years beyond that. So let's not say that Congress is overfunding this effort at this point, uh, but I think it is encouraging that the research dollars are starting to show up. Um, the last point that I'll make is that in addition to research dollars, public-private partnerships are going to be central to this process. So as we talk about developing MRV methods and environmental monitoring methods, we want to do that alongside private industry. Again, especially given all of the private industry investment that's already cropping up, as well as these firms that you see imaged on the right um, that are uh, using and uh, trading any of this uh, uh, at scale. And so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our next speakers, um, and hopefully we'll be able to dig into uh, a little bit more about MRV. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation, um, Jessica. And while we transition uh, to our next speaker, we have our next poll question, which in the interest of time, we're going to close the poll questions a little bit faster. Puts a little bit of heat on everyone. So this question is um, helping us better understand your current knowledge or involvement in marine CDR. Wonderful, thanks everyone. Looks like a lot of people are excited to learn more. <laughs> 
Um, wonderful. So next up, we have Dr. Sarah Cooley, Director of Climate Science at Ocean Conservancy. Sarah is a carbon cycle scientist by training who works to ensure that decisions about ocean impacts of climate change and ocean-based climate solutions, including OCDR approaches, are supported by multidisciplinary evidence. Uh, she'll help us frame more of the decision-making landscape and the questions around monitoring, reporting, and verification. So on to you, Sarah. I'm muted now. Can anybody see my slides? All That's right, great. great. I have a multi-monitor situation that was making it confusing. Um, thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Darcy. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Um, yeah, so today is a little bit refreshing. Um, I get to talk a little bit about um, monitoring, reporting, and verification, which I don't usually get asked to talk about. So I'm pleased to uh, bring some thoughts to that space. Um, so everything that, let's see, all right, advancing. Okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of policy context first. Um, all of our uh, planetary goals to uh, curb greenhouse gas emissions are built on the Paris Agreement. This is the legally binding international treaty adopted at COP21 in 2015. And the goal is to limit global warming to well below two degrees, preferably one and a half degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. And um, this, uh, the parties to the agreement submit and refine their plans for climate action uh, as nationally determined contributions on five-year cycles. And this rather busy uh, slide really shows kind of where we are, look at the center, um, and then where you know our policies and action have committed us to be and where our pledges and targets aspire to put us. Um, and so all of this context is really all about how much greenhouse gas we have put into the atmosphere and we continue to put into the atmosphere. Now, moving forward, thinking about a refinement of this relevant climate policy. So the Bali Action Plan was adopted in 2007 and this introduced monitoring, reporting and verification framework. And so nations can actually measure how they're doing on mitigating their greenhouse gas emissions using this framework. And so mitigation actions are the things that curb greenhouse gas emissions or also address the, uh, the quantities of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so you can see here, the things that count include things that address greenhouse gas uh, grasses directly, um, things that really um, improve uh, sustainable development, and then also progress toward uh, implementing mitigation actions. And so this leads us into a lot of uh, kind of difficult to navigate policy territory in terms of whether a nation's uh, you know, plan to reduce greenhouse gases um, you know, measures up to the reality, what they're on the hook for, and then also um, this idea of like avoided emissions versus emissions that actually got remediated. And so in every case, the, the, the role of carbon dioxide removal is still debated in terms of like, should this be something that helps us reduce our overall emissions or should this be something that helps us um, clean up legacy emissions? And um, you know, most folks in the scientific community are saying it should really only be used for legacy emissions, especially given the scaling considerations that Jess just went over. Um, you know, you can't just like, you know, let the tub overflow and then you know be mopping it up and thinking that you have fixed the problem and so we can talk a little bit more about this conundrum um, in the discussion and i look forward to that um so actually uh this is this is kind of a a, a good summary from uh california's own andrew dixon about what monitoring reporting and verification are so basically seeing what you did telling someone else that you did it verifying that you really did what you said so I always introduce people to this verification concept as like, is the reality living up to the dream? Um, and so what we're doing here is really looking at greenhouse gas effects. Um, are we looking at uh, whether carbon dioxide has been captured? Has it been stored? Um, had, what's the escape potential for any of this carbon that has been removed? Is it geographically fixed? Is it additional to uh, carbon removal that might occur already due to natural processes. And then, of course, there's this idea that 
uh, sustainable development goal effects um, are also relevant in the monitoring, reporting, and verification framework. So have, have any of these methods endangered ocean biogeochemistry? Have they endangered ocean ecosystems? Has it put the global commons or peace or governance at risk? Those things can actually ding you in the ballet framework against monitoring and reporting and verification. It's not just carbon math necessarily. There's other pieces that we need to be thinking about if you read the, if you do a close read of the uh, international climate policies at play here. Now, when we think about monitoring, reporting, and verification and ocean carbon dioxide removal, we know that verification of any effect on greenhouse gas uh, levels is central to really implementing and confirming that you know nationally determined contributions actually played out the way they were supposed to. Um, ocean CDR approaches really don't have robust monitoring, reporting, and verification protocols right now. Just uh, cited some, some examples. Um, and what we're really looking at are a, an array of, of actions, um, which all have different ways of uh, capturing uh, carbon dioxide from the water column, uh, hoping that that carbon dioxide will be replenished by atmospheric carbon dioxide, thereby giving you the greenhouse gas effect that you were hoping for, um, and then how long that carbon is actually locked away. Um, and really looking at that entire cycle is what's essential. And for ocean protocols, we really don't have those robust protocols right now. Next slide. Okay, interestingly, when we think about carbon capture, um, direct air capture and sort of uh, pumping down into geological reservoirs, um, when you do it into the seabed, it's kind of the only ocean-related method that's really the, uh, ready for MRV at this time. You can monitor, you can verify, you can report how much carbon you've captured and you've stored. You can also monitor escapes from your pipelines or from your um, rock structures that you're pumping the carbon dioxide into. It's geographically fixed. A lot of these uh, efforts happen near shore. And so that makes that your governance situation pretty clear. You're putting it into perhaps state waters, um, you know, or under state waters where uh, jurisdiction of ocean spaces is much clearer. Um, rock methods have a more defined durability and stability. They're not really messing with the local biogeochemistry very much. So you're not getting these ecosystem impacts. Um, and then there's also um, much lower sort of public uh, engagement um, risks because, you know, unfortunately, our coastal zones have been so disturbed by pipelines, by drilling, by things like that already that, um, you know, there's not as much of a, of, a, of a mystery about how any of this would go. So I think that's something interesting to consider. And I think this very clear cut story is what is in the mind of many policymakers when they're thinking, oh, we can certainly quantify how much carbon is being captured and stored because there's this model that exists in people's imaginations and that uh, really um, does not include any of the biological complexity and the chemical complexity that um, a lot of the ocean CDR methods uh, uh, incorporate, which I know some of the other speakers will talk about. So when we think about I didn't have a good word, but when we think about dispersed ocean CDR approaches, so um, you know climate interventions in the ocean, and um, this figure is from Lisa Levin and, and uh, collaborators' paper this year, but it really kind of gives you an idea of all the different uh, climate interventions that that have been proposed for the ocean, sort of where they operate, sort of on the ocean space, but also like how that uh, sifts through the water column. And what we see here is some really challenging to bound processes. You are talking in some cases about cultivating biomass, which then would be you know, packaged or sent down to the deep ocean. Um, you know, bacteria go to work on it, and then you have decay in the deep ocean. Then you have ocean currents. So we're looking at a very um, porous system from like a boundaries point of view. And it makes it really, really challenging to draw a circle around the change that was proposed to be made and whether or not it was actually made. Um, oops, I rolled forward. Okay, and so one of the things that I, I like to point to is um, one of the, the challenges here is that 
in most of these dispersed ocean carbon dioxide removal methods that you know have been proposed there's this change over time so it's like the leakage factor is higher than if we have um, you know if we're sending carbon dioxide down into a geological layer and turning it into a mineral substance um, you know there's very little leakage very little change in carbon over time after you've deposited that carbon but when you're talking about sending a mass of, of carbon dioxide into uh, deep ocean currents or um, into biomass that then has sort of an undetermined fate, you're looking at a system where there's a much different decay rate and there's loss of carbon from that system. So your carbon isn't necessarily stored or sequestered, it's kind of like put away for later. And so this paper um, from Dave Siegel and company is a really nice demonstration of what happens if you put carbon dioxide into the ocean at different levels and locations. Um, and you know, I encourage you to like look at the paper and spend some time with it. This figure is not really easy to kind of wrap your brain around just on a, at a glance. But really the story that they're telling here is that location and depth matter greatly to how much that carbon can be considered put away for. And I think that's really important to remember. Right now, our verification, our monitoring, reporting, and verification, and um, even you know uh, the voluntary carbon market does not have a great treatment of loss of carbon over time from any of these storage options. And you know perhaps uh, someone with a financial mind would say, oh, that's an easy term to add. We can do that. But at the time, at this time, it's really not in the conversation. And I think that's a really important uh, point that that science can bring to this conversation. That like we're talking about processes that don't have a start and a stop necessarily. There's there's like a like a start and like a tailing. Um, so I think that's something to really consider. One of the things that um, I consider that I think about a lot, and I mentioned this earlier in my talk about whether um, ocean carbon dioxide MRV should consider other outcomes. Um, by, by some you know, accounts, like a close reading of the, the international climate policy relevant here, um, you know, uh, sustainable development uh, related outcomes to ecosystems and human systems are important to consider in verification of the, the effect you've made. Um, and so one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is like we have sort of four possible outcomes. If there's a method of ocean carbon dioxide removal that is cannot be verified and it carries environmental or social risks, that seems like an easy one. Do not proceed. Um, you know, on the other hand, you might have something that where the carbon removal is verified and the environmental and social benefits are either neutral or positive. It's like, go for it. That seems like a good idea. But it's a gray area in between about whether we can't verify and maybe it has other co-benefits. Well, you probably wouldn't get many uh, investors wanting to, um, you know, jump in and buy carbon credits from that. On the other hand, if we have a carbon removal method that is verified, but it has some serious environmental or social risks, um, that's that's a decision-making process under uncertainty that communities will have to engage with. Um, there will have to be some decisions about trade-offs that communities engage in. And we need to have these conversations be uh, extremely inclusive so that everyone's vision of a, the, what they want out of the, the ocean for the future, what a future ocean looks like to them, we need to make sure those visions are actually incorporated. Uh, there's a number of people involved in Ocean CDR um, right now. The interest groups vary. Um, we did a little study looking at who's involved, what do they want to know. Everyone involved wants to have more information, more transparency, and no side effects. So that's good, right? Everybody's like really kind of got their, their, their hearts in the right place. Most people really want a lot of precautionary research uh, guided by a code of conduct. Uh, some people are really worried about like, well, if I do the research, are people going to think that I'm in favor of geoengineering? And so we should probably all agree, like, the pursuit of knowledge doesn't necessarily say that you think it's a great idea in the long run. Um, knowledge creators are really focused on things like uh, developing collaborations, um, building the community of practice, whereas the knowledge users are looking at diverse voices in the revert, in the uh, R&D, uh, the decision-making. Um, they're curious about what outcomes of all sorts might exist. Uh, 
nobody wants to deal with rogue actors and an unregulated system. And then also, um, you know, policymakers are really worried on how do we deliver on our international climate commitments. Um, so I'm thinking that in, in the long run, we may settle on uh, the need for sort of a gated system to think about the verification of carbon outcomes from ocean carbon dioxide uh, removal approaches, as well as ecosystem outcomes and uh, societal outcomes. And when I talk about societal outcomes, um, you know, I'm talking about things like um, what would uh, in truly inclusive governance look like of any of these methods and the decision making around these methods. Um, if if uh, implementation of any of these methods were like a highly privatized system only decided on by a few, that would be a number of steps backwards from the inclusive ocean governance that we have developed over multiple decades of work to bring people to the table and include various voices. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying like, you know, there's, there could be social system impacts, we could be displacing people who have, uh, you know, make their living from the water, and all of those uh, considerations need to be accounted for in any decisions about whether or not uh, a particular ocean carbon dioxide removal method should move forward in its research uh, or development or even implementation. And um, just in closing, there's this nice paper that I just became aware of this week that um, talks a little bit about the physical science checkpoints in marine cloud brightening research. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of commonalities here. So I think it's really helpful for us to be looking at other areas of inquiry and thinking about how folks are um, you know, thinking about the challenges, thinking about the entire picture of challenges and um, moving forward. So I'll stop there. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. That was great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, before we get to our third speaker, we have another poll question. This poll question is asking which marine CDR approach you are particularly interested in, again, to help inform the co-design of our future webinars and engagements with this community. All right, fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Our third presenter is Dr. Christopher L. Sabine. Uh, he will be discussing the science behind how to actually measure and verify carbon removal from the ocean. Chris is the University of, of Hawaii at Manoa Interim Vice Provost for Research and Scholarship and a full professor in the Oceanography Department. Since getting his PhD at UH in 1992, he has published over 160 journal articles and book chapters on carbon cycling, climate change, and ocean acidification. His MCDR focus is more on the MRV side of things, and he's currently funded to look at the potential impact of different forms of ocean alkalinity enhancement, or OAE, on corals. Chris, passing it to you. Thank you. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak with all of you. Uh, I'd like to just build on what Sarah was talking about and thinking about how uh, to uh, further enhance, she talked about the kind of political and social implications of uh, MRV. I'd like to talk about some of the physical implications. And one of the challenges I think we've got is that uh, many of the policymakers and some of the companies that are considering this Think of verification as, as a kind of a one-way process. You know, you, you, you make some measurements and there you've verified that what you're doing is, is actually making uh, the intended uh, consequences. But uh, I guess I have a little different view and, and almost would consider that we need to add another letter to this, uh, to this approach. And I would argue that we also need something along the lines of attribution. Now, attribution is different from verification in that it tends to be a circular process, right? We, uh, 
we have an idea of what we think our uh, purposeful manipulation is going to do to the environment, we create models that suggest that it's going to take up CO2 from the atmosphere, but we actually need the measurements that validate that, and we need to show that what we intended to do is actually what we did. And um, along those lines, there are three basic principles that I think we need to consider when we're uh, thinking about how are we going to do uh, verification or, or attribution. The first of those is, is you need to measure the right things, right? So we're all talking about absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, hopefully you're all familiar with the fact that there are four measurable carbon parameters and in the ocean and within the ocean context, we know that we can measure any two of these parameters and calculate the rest of the system. So that's critical that we measure at least two of those parameters. Now, uh, we know that the uh, uptake of CO2 by the oceans is done uh, as an uptake of CO2 gas, but we also need to understand that CO2 is stored in the oceans in the form of DIC, right? The CO2 reacts with the water molecules to form carbonic acid and all of its dissociation process, products. So one might argue, well, all right, so we just measure CO2 and we can measure DIC, and then we've, we've got it locked down. On the other hand, if what you're trying to do is uh, uh, a marine CDR through uh, alkalinity enhancement, perhaps what you want to actually measure is the total alkalinity, the thing that you're actually trying to manipulate. So it's not always clear exactly what you want to measure. And I like to think of it in terms of this plot, this diagram here in the middle, this tertiary diagram, where we show the four different uh, carbon parameters. And on the corners of this diagram are the three basic processes that impact these, uh, these parameters. You've got ocean physics, gas exchange, and biology. The proximity of that, where this uh, parameter is to the corner, tells you how strongly that particular process affects that parameter. So total alkalinity, for example, is strongly affected by ocean physics. It's very minimally affected by ocean biology, and it's not at all affected by gas exchange. So you see it down in that corner by the ocean physics. And so, one thing that we can do is kind of look at where these parameters are. Another aspect of this tertiary diagram is the strongest constraints on the whole system is if you can pick two parameters that are the farthest apart from each other. So PCO2 and pH, for example, are the least effective pair to measure if you're trying to constrain the rest of the system. Now, I've just been focusing here on the carbon parameters, but of course, if we're doing this in the context of a changing system, so you need to think about what other uh, factors might be influencing these uh, drivers, ocean physics, gas exchange, biology, that in turn will affect the carbon parameters. So uh, we can think about, particularly like if you're manipulating the, the ocean biology, it might be important to also me measure biological uh, parameters that constrain that ocean biology in addition to the carbon system. Anyway, so the first step is to measure the right things. The second thing is we've got to understand what the background signal is. How do you know how you're changing things if you don't know the, the, the composition of, of the ocean carbon parameters before you start? This is a plot. Uh, from the Hawaii Ocean Time Series, what we used to think of as a, as a marine desert in a ligotrophic gyre where very little happens, or at least that's so what we thought uh, 30 years ago before we started this time series. And what we've observed is that even in this oligotrophic ocean far away from uh, any local pressures, that we're seeing quite a bit of variability. And you can see in this plot, the red line sh shows the uh, Mauna Loa atmospheric CO2 trend over time. The blue lines show the ocean PCO2 measurements. And we see that surface ocean CO2 is 20 times more variable than the atmospheric CO2, even in this um, oligotrophic gyre. Uh, 
So you say, all right, well, that's that's PCO2. We know that's a very dynamic parameter. Maybe we should be measuring uh, DIC instead. But we see that the DIC changes over time and the variability on many different time scales uh, is also quite substantial. And you see that, uh, for example, in these particular areas, we can see trends that extend over decades that could completely obfuscate the uh, particular signal that you might be trying to uh, understand if you're not uh, properly uh, understanding what the background signal is. So it's really important to know the background signal. Now this is uh, a particular challenge for the US West Coast, the California current system, where we see even more dynamic systems in that coastal area and in the coastal upwelling. Uh, I will note here, so we're showing here the uh, PCO2 changes over time in the CCE mooring, which is in the Southern California region. And I will note that the y-axis shown here is uh, over three times the magnitude of the y-axis that I was showing for the uh, station Aloha. The third step is understanding the long-term measurements, using uh, long-term measurements to understand the retention. This is something Sarah talked a bit about. You know, when we understand that, that whatever process we're trying to manipulate, there's always uh, a, a feedback, a, a leakage, if you will, of that CO2. And so in this case, on the, the cartoon on the left, we're talking about uh, ocean biological enhancement that uh, although you may be uh, able to demonstrate a bloom, you actually need to also demonstrate that that bloom is in fact sequestering carbon. And because there is, there is leakage from that, there's, there's going to be decomposition that releases CO2 right back into the atmosphere. And then even if it is sequestered, how deep is it sequestered? How long is it going to be sequestered? And that's illustrated with this figure in the right. You know, you need to know, are you taking up that carbon for 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years? That makes a big difference in the efficacy of this particular process and whether we uh, want to uh, consider whether it's, it's worthy of moving forward with. Um, models have shown, if we just take the example of the natural uptake of CO2, the, the oceans are absorbing 2.6 billion tons of carbon uh, annually, and yet models suggest that it's going to take decades before we can actually see that signal in the, uh, in the ocean carbon processes. So um, we need to think about how long do we actually need to measure carbon in the ocean to, to actually verify that that carbon has been sequestered. It's even worse if you're talking about trying to do this simply from measuring uh, air-sea gas exchange. Again, the default seems to be, oh, well, we're taking up CO2. So if we just measure the flux, show that there's a flux of CO2 into the ocean, then, then we're all set. But it's not quite that simple. As you see from the, the plot on the right side that I showed earlier, we can easily show uh, well, easily after three decades show that CO2 is increasing in the surface ocean. But if we're looking at the air-sea flux, which is made up, determined by the delta PCO2, this change in, in surface water CO2 relative to the air that's also increasing, it's much more difficult to show a trend in the CO2 flux. So we need to measure more than just that air-sea exchange if we want to validate uh, what's going on. Now, one uh, positive thing is that, again, if we're talking about the California current system, this is one of the most well-studied regions when it comes to monitoring and, and showing uh, ocean carbon uptake and storage uh, in the natural systems. And this plot just shows some of the measurements that have been made in the California current system. Now, I will uh, temper that a little bit in suggesting that uh, this measurements, this uh, plot is showing all the measurements that have been made irrespective of when they're made. So if you were to actually only show the data that are collected, say at one particular point in time, uh, it's gonna be a much smaller uh, plot than what, what we've shown here. Also, I'll point out that the, the size of the dots that are shown here, 
is actually substantially larger than the representative area of that measurement. So uh, if we do uh, impose a marine CDR approach in the California current system, and we want to take on a monitoring reporting and verification uh, aspect of this, it's really critical that we do measurements uh, both before, during, and after that process in the exact location where these, uh, these processes are being manipulated and where we want to demonstrate that there is an effect. So I will just stop there and uh, again reiterate these three um, points that I, I tried to make in my short presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Our final presenter is Dr. David Coick. David is the chief scientist at Ocean Visions, where he works to bring innovative and durable solutions to complex challenges facing our ocean. David has a PhD in oceanography and did postdoctoral work on new technologies to improve the health of our ocean. This training has prepared him well to lead science at Ocean Visions and to contribute to shaping the rapidly growing interest in ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. Uh, as our final speaker, David's going to help us bring this um, back to the question of how the MCDR community can begin to uh, address these research questions and challenges that have been put posed by the other speakers today. On to you, David. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I can't tell if the screen share is set up okay. Are you all just seeing me speak now? I don't have slides to share. Yes, we can see you. Maybe oh. Chris and I can go off screen if that would help increase attention on you. Sure, let's try that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This has been a really, really great session. I've really enjoyed listening to Jessica, to Sarah, and to Chris. And I think it's just been a really nice opportunity to highlight both the potential and the challenges of ocean-based carbon removal or marine-based carbon dioxide removal. I want to touch on and review really quickly some of the main messages that we've heard from the earlier speakers. Jessica did a really nice job introducing us to the concept of carbon dioxide removal and talking about the potential role of the oceans in contributing to carbon dioxide removal at scale, that is, in a hypothetical scenario where we're using ocean-based carbon removal or marine-based carbon dioxide removal um, to deploy as a climate change mitigation tool. Then Sarah led in and talked about a lot of the details of marine uh, carbon dioxide removal, MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification. She led in with some of the history about why uh, and how we think about MRV, about the need to think about social and environmental effects alongside the carbon accounting, and then right at the end introduced the concept of stage gates. And then Chris joined and talked about all the complexities of measuring these things at scale and what that means for setting up a global MRV system. And so what I want to spend some time talking about is how we get to from where we are now to this future that Jessica, Sarah, and Chris talked about, where this can become a gigaton scale or a climate relevant scale tool in the toolkit used for mitigating climate change. And there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not we will get there. Um, and so what I am focused on, what we are focused on at Ocean Visions is trying to create an enabling environment that allows us to do accelerated, responsible research and development so that we can provide um, the necessary information to make well-informed decisions about the efficacy and impacts of these marine CDR technologies. And basically, right now, we have a very limited evidence base from which to evaluate those primary questions. We have very little information about how effective these technologies will be, what their environmental effects will be in the real world, and what their social effects will be in the real world. And when I say effects, I both mean the potential negative effects as well as any potential positive effects. And so in the near term, I think the community, and I mean this more than the scientists alone, needs to come together to help build this innovative 
environment where responsible research can take place quickly and where results can be shared globally and we can iterate and learn off one another. And I think there are basically four pillars to building a responsible research environment. The first is the science. The second is around community building. The third is about analyzing pathways to scalability. And the fourth is around the policy environment that can provide all of that uh, and provide the foundation for all of this. So let me dive in here and start by talking around about the science. It is crucially important in the next several years before 2030 that we start a substantial number of controlled field trials. These are real world in water tests of marine carbon dioxide removal technologies. Right now, almost none of the carbon dioxide removal technologies that we've talked about in this presentation have had fit for purpose field testing. That is tests in real world environments that allow you to assess the efficacy and the impacts of the technologies. And if we don't do this, we will never have an evidence base from which to make sound data-driven or evidence-driven decisions. We will always sit here speculating about efficacy and impacts. So we have to do these controlled field trials and they need to start wherever they can start in a way that is done responsibly, um, equitably, and ethically. I think we have to keep in mind that small scale field trials do not pose irreversible risks to marine ecosystems. There's no evidence to support that idea. And we can look back to the long history of scientific field trials around ocean iron fertilization as evidence that those field trials did not leave irreversible effects on marine ecosystems. We also need, when we're thinking about permitting and allowing these field trials to go forward, we have to consider um, that if we don't do these field trials, that we introduce the risk of not developing adequate solutions to the climate crisis because we're not doing the necessary science on the full comprehensive suite of solutions. And so I think that's a really important um, idea that we all need to wrestle with, this risk-risk trade-off as we balance the risks of any one of the science of marine CDR against the risks of failing to develop adequate solutions to the climate crisis. And implicit in that is an understanding that we are on a non-static baseline. We're on a downward trending baseline as we see the devastating effects of marine heat waves and ocean acidification. And this is especially prevalent along um, the west coast of North America and British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California. So I think that the number one thing that we need to do in for the science pillar of what I just laid out around bringing the community together are controlled field trials. The, there are also a number of other key science needs that are best performed or best answered in non-field trial settings, and those should proceed expeditiously as well. Those include laboratory experiments and mesocosm experiments, as well as continued modeling work. The second pillar of bringing everybody together, I think, is really around community building. And in order to create an accelerated environment for responsible research and development, we need the engagement of brilliant minds from lots of different disciplines. So not only scientists and engineers alone and not only oceanographers alone, but we need technical folks from non-traditionally um, or non-oceanographic fields, as well as all of the folks who come from backgrounds outside of technical fields, outside of science and engineering, who can help us think through the multi-dimensional or myriad opportunities and challenges around MCDR technologies. And I think throughout this, we have to be asking ourselves not who, but how. And by that, I mean, we need to pay a lot less attention, I think, to the institution that people are coming from, but instead to consider much more carefully how they're doing the work. Are they transparent? Are they doing work that facilitates outside scrutiny and peer review? Are they doing things that are equitable and a decrease in equality? And if the answer to those questions is yes, I think we have to focus much more on the kinds of work that people are doing. And I say this because the MCDR field right now has a lot of um, entrepreneurial startup efforts. These are for-profit companies that are trying to scale MCDR technologies. And many of the times these companies are at the cutting edge of technology development and scientific advancement in the field. 
And I think it's really important that the community come together as a whole and work together from day one instead of, um, instead of prematurely discrediting any efforts. And so I, I think that's a really key part of building community. I think that there, the next thing around community building is engagement with the UN decade. I think many of you know that this is the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And I think there are tremendous possibilities through this UN decade to raise the profile of MCDR technologies in order to create the enabling conditions for accelerated research and development. And part of that, I think, is building open tools that allow interested individuals and communities to explore scenarios and to consider the opportunities and risks of ocean-based CDR technologies. We're doing some of this work at Ocean Visions, and I also saw that Jessica highlighted some of the work that NOAA does to build these online um, portals like the aquaculture planning portal that allow folks to engage with the complex decision-making support tools that they need to make smart decisions for their own communities. There are also a number of other online fora, some of which are hosted by Ocean Visions, like our roadmaps or the Ocean CDR community that we host, that allow opportunities for people to come together to discuss ideas and to collaboratively brainstorm. And I think these are important for building up a global brain trust that allows us to tackle more complex problems than we can by ourselves. The last aspect of community building that I want to touch on is this idea about building regional hubs for research and development and for innovation in the marine sector. There are already really great examples of this in Alaska and Iceland, and the recently introduced Ocean Regional Opportunity and Innovation Act which was introduced in the Senate by Lisa Murkowski and Maria Cantwell is a really great example of how we might think about building out ocean clusters all around the West Coast and all across North America and globally that can allow us to um, create dense centers of knowledge that can really advance responsible research and development for ocean-based carbon removal technologies. The third pillar of bringing the community together involves thinking about how technologies scale. And, and so in order for these technologies to have real world impact, they both need to um, be demonstrated to be efficacious and safe on the scale of individual controlled field trials and science experiments, but we also need to see viable pathways to scalability because without those pathways to scalability, they're unlikely to have climatically relevant impacts. That is, they're not likely to grow large enough to take out substantial quantities of carbon remove of carbon from the atmosphere that would allow us to help mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And so these scaling analyses need to happen in parallel with the science. That is, we need to start to understand the pathways for growth for these technologies if they prove efficacious and safe during these early stage research and development phases. And so these scaling analyses include site suitability analyses. They include um, understanding the various existing in industries and infrastructure that could be um, either repurposed or co-purposed to support ocean-based carbon dioxide removal technology. And they also include various forms of market analyses that allow folks to understand the economic scalability of these technologies. And a key part of that last uh, part of scalability, economic scalability, is also understanding the extent to which these MCDR technologies may or may not produce valuable co-products that can provide additional re revenue streams and lower overall system cost. And then the fourth pillar of bringing everybody together is really around policy. And at the core, we have to make it easy to do responsible research and development there's a number of efforts underway to try to make sure that the research is responsible. These include um, codes of conduct being developed by the Aspen Institute and the American Geophysical Union, among others. But we also have to make it easy to do that research. We have to make doing MCDR research part of national policy. We have to think about um, developing areas where it's very easy to do research via pre-permitted test beds. These are concepts that are drawn from um, the US Navy as well as the US Department of Energy 
where uh, sites are pre-permitted to facilitate and streamline rapid testing of technologies as they're coming online. One really great example of this is the PacWave site off the coast of Oregon. And then we need to acknowledge, and I think this is something that some of the other speakers have touched on, that really sound public policy on MCDR technologies is going to require cooperation across sectors and it's going to require money. I, I think we shouldn't kid ourselves, but this is going to be an expensive endeavor. It's one that doesn't need to be, uh, the cost doesn't need to be borne by an individual jurisdiction alone. The U.S. can contribute to this, state governments can contribute to this, but this can be a global effort. But we really need to be realistic with ourselves that a full-scale R&D effort on MCDR technologies is on the scale of billions of dollars to fully answer the comprehensive set of questions that allow us to make more well-informed decisions about efficacy and impacts. And finally, the last thing I'll say about um, this pillar is that I think we need to come together now to really clearly articulate what some of these stage gates are. Sarah introduced this concept of stage gates, that is that the research proceeds in an incremental manner as each question is answered. And if questions aren't able to be answered satisfactorily, then we stop advancing a technology. And this is a concept that uh, lots of folks who work on MCDR technologies talk about, but it's something I think that needs a little bit more specificity and clarity so that the community can come together and commonly agree on the ways in which these technologies will be evaluated in terms of their capacity to make net additional contributions to climate change mitigations and sustainable development goals. So with that, I'll stop speaking and say thank you very much for your attention, and I am very glad to participate in the Q&A section following. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, David, and to all the speakers for your presentations and your perspectives today. Um, we have a little bit of time right now for a moderated question and answer session, um, and you can type questions or comments for any of the experts into the chat box and the control panel on your right, or I guess wherever it is on your screen. Um, before we get into the questions, we're going to launch our final poll question for the audience. I think Natalie is going to put up here for a second. This one is on what topics you are interested in seeing covered in future webinars. We realize this was um, a broad brush on kind of a pretty big topic. So which ones would you like a deeper dive into in the coming weeks and months? Great. Let's, maybe we can move to our responses. And we know we're flashing these kind of briefly for everybody, but our organizing committee will be um, examining these afterwards as well to try to put together uh, the future series. Thanks, Natalie. We have some great questions in the chat, and I want to start off with a broad question on MCDR research and roles, and also on codes of conduct. And so the first part of the question is, who should be doing MCDR research? Um, what's the role of academic, government, and private institutions? And David touched on this just now, and I just wanted to see if there were any additional thoughts from our other speakers. I can say some things because I, I did a I did a study of who's involved. Um, you know, I think there's really valuable contributions being provided by um, information seekers with lots of affiliations. Um, you know, there's some <clears throat> fantastic research coming out of university and federal laboratories in addition to private industry um, research labs as well. Um, you know, the, the research that we can see is the research that's being shared in the public domain. Um, you know, there's a lot of really um, um, thoughtful uh, uh, research that's being done. Um, we can't see research that's not being shared in the public domain. Um, so it's hard to kind of gauge 
the magnitude of everything that's happening. Um, you know, if we can't, if, if, it, if it's not being, if it's not being shared, I mean, this goes back to MRV, right? <laughs> if you're not telling people about it, nobody's going to know about it. Um, but I think there's, there's really um, great uh, dedication to um, searching for like real hard truths from um, researchers with all sorts of affiliations right now. And, you know, we're seeing a real interest among folks with all kinds of affiliations to collaborating and, um, you know, being really um, um, active participants in the scientific process. Um, so I think that I find that very inspiring. Thank you, Sarah. Anybody else want to chime in before we move to our next question? I guess at, at the risk of perhaps offending some of the audience, I, I would just add that I, I think perception and public trust is critical that we maintain that and, and perpetuate that. Uh, right now, I think there is general trust generally uh, of the scientific approach. And so I think it's less, perhaps less important who is doing the research than a perception of who is funding that research. And therefore, I, 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 I would argue that I think it's critical for government agencies to get more involved, and, and they are um, now. But, but historically, I think a lot of this research has been funded by those that potentially are likely to profit most from the results. And that can perpetuate a, uh, a, di a bit of distrust in the community. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, government agencies and NGOs and philanthropic groups are supporting more of this research. Thanks, Chris. That leads a little bit into this next question of code of, for a code of conduct for NCDR research and what should go into a code of conduct? Who should be developing the code of conduct? Should there be mechanisms to ensure that the code of conduct is adopted or enforceable? Um, and also, are there any codes of conduct underway or existing models in the MCDR community that we should be looking to? Uh, I'll jump in here. Um, there's a lot of work that's been underway over the last several years to develop codes of conduct for uh, MCDR, responsible research and development. The Aspen Institute has led a process for several years. Um, the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, is developing a framework for thinking about responsible research on climate interventions that includes both carbon dioxide removal as well as um, non-carbon dioxide removal climate interventions, so things like solar radiation management. There are also a number of other entities, including the Exploring Ocean Iron Solutions Group that's published its own code of conduct. Sarah's been involved in the number of academic publications that have touched on aspects of codes of conduct, and there are a number of private companies that have published their own codes of conduct. There's a lot of overlap in the content between many of these documents, and so I think the key here is trying to get people to realize they're not starting from scratch, that there's a long history of codes of conduct for doing ethical research in fields that have um, could pose ethical dilemmas, and the, the key, I think, is really getting a code of conduct or potentially more than one um, out there in the public domain, widely circulated, getting um, actors across sectors, uh, academia, government, private sector, et cetera, to um, voluntarily adhere to this code of conduct or bind themselves to this code of conduct, and then to make sure that that code of conduct is um, uh, you know, it's just very easily seen and and um, can very easily be referenced when activities are occurring. So you could imagine something like a report card or a check, you know, a checklist that would allow you to uh, allow somebody to really quickly see whether or not a, a re given research activity is um, following a given code of conduct. Yes, I'd like to add to that if I could. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, Dave, that was a great overview. Thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, I'm actually helping draft the next uh, Aspen Institute sort of iteration of the, the code of conduct work. Uh, Aspen had kind of put out kind of 
why and what is needed. And now we're trying to put some meat on the bones and really explain some of the details. Um, right now, it's an, inter it's an international uh, interdisciplinary group of primarily academics. Um, and we know that that's sort of just scratching the surface of who needs to be involved and in helping um, you know, draft and vet and, and improve a document like this. Um, the vision is that it will be iteratively built upon and improved over time. Um, the problem right now is that most public audiences are entirely not familiar with this topic. And so people can't have an opinion on how the research is done if they know zilch about the topic. And so that's why we're like, okay, for, for lack of anything better right now, it has to be kind of begun from an academic perspective. But one thing that we're really uh, talking very vigorously about is how can we make sure that um, this uh, helps instruct researchers on sort of how to um, how to how to undertake ethical re research, um, but also recognizing that the people who are doing the research are often coming from a very particular value system, which may or may not match that of the publics in the places where these methods may be um, uh, attempted. So that's been a real, I, I love this activity because it's been an academic stretch for me to learn about sort of the ethical and moral and sort of social science issues that really like underpin this idea of like Western natural scientists conception of nature. Um, but I think it's absolutely got to be inclusive. It's got to be iterative. Um, you know, but I also agree with Dave that it would be ideal if we could kind of come up with sort of a, you know, hallmarks of someone adhering to the code of conduct and doing the research in a highly ethical and transparent way. So more on that within the year, I hope. Thanks, Sarah. Um, to touch a little bit more on this regulatory environment. Uh, there's a question I want to jump to in the chat about whether any regulations around this research currently exist for real-world experiments, or can researchers play fast and loose because there are no current regulations? I'll take that one. Um, there's a lot of existing regulations out there that uh, probably apply to a lot of these different methods of CDR that we're talking about, but that may not have been written with CDR in mind. Um, and so there, it, it's challenging to understand how exactly CDR sort of fits into these sort of niche spaces, right? Um, that's true, you know, uh, especially when we're talking about very close to shore where a lot of these early experiments are likely to happen because infrastructure is plentiful there. Um, there may be as many as like six or seven different regulatory bodies that have jurisdiction over a particular spot. Right, so that's going to be heavily regulated. Um, when we move, you know, further and further out from shore, and especially in the international space, um, there's international laws that prevent the kind of experiments that we're talking about quite explicitly, um, you know, with a handful of exceptions that are probably very difficult uh, to push through uh, in terms of permitting. Um, so one of the things, and I, I want to emphasize that I am not a policy expert, a policy worker, or or anyone with any kind of authority whatsoever uh, in the policy space. But one thing, I am policy curious. Uh, so one of the things that uh, policy uh, experts are thinking about right now is, you know, what does that patchwork of regulations look like? How do they apply um, to some of these CDR methods? Is there a way to consolidate that guidance into sort of like an easy to use packet that both, um, uh, you know, respects the letter of the regulations that are currently in place, but also the spirit of the regulations that are currently in place. How do we make CDR safe, sustainable, and fair for everybody? Thanks, Jess. Uh, we've had a number of questions about the efficacy of some of the different CDR approaches um, and where the carbon that's being removed in the ocean is actually going to go. And these are good questions, and I think we're going to save those for future sessions where we can dig a little deeper into those specific approaches. Um, I want to move to for our last question here into the ecosystem impacts realm. Um, David had mentioned that the small scale field trials are not posing ecosystem impacts, but when we talk about commercializing these approaches, we're talking about much bigger scales. 
Um, and given that there is a range of CDR approaches being proposed from more nature-based solutions to more technological approaches, um, what do we know about potential impacts to the surrounding marine environment from these different approaches? And what types of measurements or studies are needed? I, Darcy, just to clarify, I did not say that there are no ecosystem impacts. I said that these field trials pose do not pose the threat of irreversible risks to marine ecosystems. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone want to speak to um, marine environment or uh, ecosystem impacts on CDR approaches or ways that we can attempt to measure, quantify, or studies that might be uh, help us inform us? I have I have a couple of thoughts on that. Things that I've been saying for a while. I do feel like we have not um, adequately included the ecosystem modeling community into some of the early inquiries that that people have been doing. Um, you know, I know that ecosystem models are not built for purpose here to to kind of incorporate. Um, you know, what would happen if you perturbed the aquatic system in one way or another. Um, but I do think that. Um, I, I want I want those I want those experts to be part of this discussion of kind of mapping out. I do think that um, you know sort of a um, a real close handshake between models and um, and uh, field experiments needs to happen because you know there's always been talk about like oh models can inform how field work is done and and I don't think we're really quite at that ideal state that, that folks would like to be when they say that sentence. Um, so I do think there's a need to kind of bring in some additional expertise. Um, and then finally, I do think that um, in addition to simply looking at, you know, specific ecosystem impacts or specific species impacts, we need to also be thinking about ecosystem function. Um, you know, when um, Date was saying, oh, we have no, you know, evidence of irreversible impacts, like that's true. But if we have a situation where a method were to have, you know, outsized impacts on, say, the recruitment of a particular fished species, that could have ripple impacts through the community that depends on that species. So I do think that the, the sort of pursuit of ecosystem outcomes also needs to look at function. I'll sort of emphasize here as well that it, you know, even though regulations in a lot of cases are designed to try to limit environmental impacts, MRV practices, as you know, Sarah kind of outlined earlier, are not designed to take those into account. Um, so we sort of have these two competing pulls on, you know, what projects are supposed to look like. And when you're trying to do something cost effectively, you're going to go with the least possible, you know, least benefit right like what what what's the lowest cost i can do this for um which may preclude maybe doing some of that more robust environmental work um so uh i i think that you know in addition to like actually sitting down doing the bench scale i think there's a role for um you know again thinking through how these uh, are going to roll together as part of a collective reporting um process Thanks, Jess. We've had great questions coming in and really thoughtful responses from our panelists. I'm going to hand it back to Alex because we're just about at time here. Well, thank you, Darcy, and thanks so much to you all for attending today's webinar. We welcome any feedback and further questions or suggestions for topics uh, for the rest of this series. Thanks again to you, Jessica, Sarah, Chris, and David for taking the time to offer your expertise and perspectives today. A uh, video recording for this session will be made available on the CKN, uh, OST, and Alaska OA Network websites. And you can also join the CKN listserv on our website uh, where you'll find more about the next MCDR webinar and other activities. We hope to see you at the next one. Take care.